Hello again YouTube and welcome back to the Pain Cave, this time without the sound of a Watt bike in the background. For two reasons, one, I'm not training for beaver at the moment, and two, there were comments about it in a previous video, so yeah, fair play, it is a little bit loud. Anyway, in this video, I want to do kind of a debrief on my race at Beaver. Uh, what I learned about the course, what I learned about the kit choices I made, and what I'd do differently again. So this is gonna serve as a little bit of a diary stroke debrief for myself, but hopefully there might be one or two things that you could take away from this. If you're gonna race the standard or half iron at Beaver, and you know, would just like a few insights that I gained from the day on the course. So I think before I get into talking about the course or anything like that, I do just wanna talk about one of the kit choices I made that worked against me and it was a learn for me more than anything. And it's that old thing about don't use something new on race day. And I did. I just bought myself in the week before the race a Garmin Phoenix 7. And one of the features of this watch is that it has auto transitions. So as you see here, when you start a triathlon or multi-sport activity, it asks you if you want auto transitions on. And I thought that's pretty cool because in theory, it saves you a bit of time faffing about. So I thought, yeah, that's a really good idea. And I tried it on a brick session and it worked really well. Now, having said that, there was no swim in the brick session. The brick session was purely bike to run. So um, I went out, did the brick session, auto transitions worked perfectly. And I thought, yeah, it's gonna work like that on the race day. One of the things that works against that, I think at uh, the Beaver course is the swim. One thing you need to know about the swim at Beaver is there's a quite a long run from the exit of the swim out of the water to T1. And for the Phoenix 7, I guess the way that this does auto transition is it's kind of looking for a change in pace and also a change in what you're doing with um, your arm, you know, because when you're in the swim, it can detect a swim stroke and it knows you're swimming at a certain pace. When you're on the bike, you're obviously gonna be moving a lot quicker and your arm will be less mobile. I guess that's the theory. I don't know how it works. I can't really find a description. But the one thing I do know is that I came out of the water and before I was even into T1, this thing was all over the place. You know, it was, are you T1? Are you on the bike? What are you doing? Consequently, I tried not to worry about it too much running from the lake to T1. I went out on the bike and thought it'll transition and it didn't. Um, it had me on the run when I was on the bike. So I had to stop on the bike probably for a good minute whilst I stopped that activity, saved that activity, um, which isn't easy with a multi-sport activity. You've got to step it through all of the activities and then you've got to wait whilst it saves it down. So I lost a good minute there getting that stopped and restarted just into a bike. Consequently, I also lost all of the GPS data on the open water swim. It became kind of trapped in a file in the watch but I could see on the watch there was the GPS match, Garmin Connect couldn't see it, so lost the open water swim. I would say that unless you, you know, you've got a very standard run from transition, a very standard setup from swim to T1 to bike to T2 and all that going on, then just stick with pressing the button. You don't lose a lot of time and you keep control. So that was kind of the first learn for me. Now let me talk about that swim. It's a pretty standard triathlon swim. Uh, the, I must admit the water quality on the day that we were swimming wasn't fantastic. Um, it was very, very cloudy. I am particularly sensitive to 
certain types of open water, I get a really strong allergic reaction. And I don't know whether that's down to sort of like algae in the water or bacteria in the water or something. There's one lake I swim in locally and I can guarantee if I've been in that water, probably two days afterwards, I'll still be nasal and, you know, just feel like I've got hay fever. Well, it was particularly bad at beaver. And I attribute that possibly to a couple of things. One, the water was very churned up when we got in. You know, it had a day of triathlon racing in it the, the day before. Um, we were fortunately, I think, no, we were the second wave off because the half iron had been out. They were out with their rib, you know, sort of scooting around in there and churning it up. It's a very silty bottom. So, you know, when we got into the water, it was, you couldn't see the bottom. And I also forgot my earplugs. So what I did was inadvertently provided two channels for water to get into my ears, nose and throat, you know, so they can get in through my nose, through my mouth and also through my ears. And normally the ears are blocked off. Consequently, for a whole week after the event, I'm still feeling like I've got kind of this hay fever thing going on. I think one thing that I would share is um, however tough you feel, don't think that you're gonna run in bare feet from the swim exit to T1 comfortably. Um, on the day we were there, the field was incredibly hard. It was like concrete. And even though it looks like a smooth grassy field, underneath that grass are tractor ruts. They're really, really uncomfortable to run on. Um, so I took a pair of trainers down and just left them under a tree at the swim exit, as did everyone else. Don't worry about it. Nobody's gonna nick your trainers. Everyone's too concerned with just getting on with their run. And um, as somebody said to me, he watched the race the day before and he said, everyone who was wearing trainers from the run from the lake to T1 was doing markedly better than everyone who wasn't wearing trainers. So let's talk about the bike now. And I'm standing alongside the grey beauty that took me around the bike course, the Greyhound. So I suppose the first question that everybody asks about this bike course is road bike or TT. And that was top of mind for me too. Um, I chose the TT bike um, and that was based on a couple of people that said, had ridden it before and they said, you'll be fine with the TT bike. I would say you will be fine with the TT bike if you've got one, provided you're confident in your ability with it, you're confident that you know how to get the most out of it, and you're confident you can climb to some degree on this. The course isn't a killer, you know, we're not talking about like hard knot pass or something like that, but there's one half decent climb in it, and there are some rollers in it that will give you a little challenge along the way. But for me, there were enough sections where I could get down on the tri bars and make the most of them that, you know, whatever I was losing elsewhere was more than made up for there. And that was proven to me by the amount of people I went past on the bike course. You know, there was a, there was a good number of people in the Olympic who'd come out the swim before me, probably hadn't messed around with the Garmin and I was still going past them on the bike. And I only put that down to the fact that I was riding a half decent bike with aero bars and I was making the most of them where I could. Now, having said that, there will be a couple of descents where I don't think the aero bars would be appropriate. There is one really nice, long, sweeping sort of descent coming back towards the castle where I would love to have been on the bars, but the road surface and also um, the, just the fact I didn't know what was coming ahead, you know, it all worked against me and I found myself just holding on to the, break, the, the base bars. Um, so, you, you know, there's that. I think in that case, that descent, I would have actually been quicker on a road bike. I'd have been down on the drops, ready with the brakes and the gears whenever I wanted them. So, you know, that's kind of one of the places where a TT bike worked against me, but on the climbs, it certainly didn't. One of the things I put that down to was on the race configuration for the bike, I slipped a brand new 1132 cassette onto the rear there. 
Now, if you've watched any of the videos where I built this bike, this bike came in one buy with a 56 tooth front train chain ring, which I swapped out for a standard double and 105 R7000 on here, you know, so it's, it's kind of a standard road bike configuration. What I found was even when I got onto that really tough climb, I could just slip it in the granny ring, stick it in the 32, and I could happily spin up that thing all day long. So again, you know, that cassette choice probably cost me somewhere because obviously with an 1132, you haven't got the closeness of ratios that you have, you know, if I'd have had say an 1128 on there or something like that, or even an 1130, it becomes a little bit more clunky. You might even find a, a situation where you're between gears, shall I say. Um, but believe me, when you need that 32, worth its weight in gold for me. Of course, you know, this is where kit choice is entirely personal. And if you were a really strong climber and incredibly accomplished with the TT rig, you might find yourself going up there very happily on a 28 and yeah, even on the bars. So your choice. But for me, and I think I'm kind of a standard bloke on the bike, um, that sort of semi-compact front, with an 1132 rear was perfect choice on this bike for me and gave me absolutely no problems on the bike course. Now, at the moment, the bike is fitted with my Super Team 88 deep carbon wheels. And um, that's the only reason for that is I've time trialed it um, this week after the race. One evening I went out and did a, a local 10 mile time trial. On race day, I didn't run these wheels and I made the reasons for that clear in a previous video. Just to summarize, if you don't want to watch that or haven't watched it, these deep section 88s need valve extenders. I've had nothing but trouble with the valve extenders. Also, on race day, if you get a flat, you've got to change that tube. And it means that you've got to carry something like this, you know, pre-prepared with a valve extender um in your in your bag there now once that's in there you're only carrying one tube and i would say you want to carry two for the race for me the american classic 58s that i put on for the race were a much better choice having those wheels on there i just need to carry a couple of standard 80s so you know basically for that one tube i've got in the bento bag there i can get two of those do you know what? I could probably get four of those in there if I was feeling super paranoid. And also, you know, if you need to change a, a tube on race day, you're not just hoping and praying that that valve extender is sealed. You can just pick one of these up, shove it in and know it's going to work. So that for me was a really good choice. But I think also there was another reason that they turned out to be a good choice and it was the road surface. I personally thought the road surface on this bike course was tough. There were big potholes um, and some of the road surfaces were incredibly rough. So really there you've got a good mix for a pinch flat or something like that. But also I think had I been running these deep section carbons, I'd have just been worried that they were going to crack or something. I, I, it might sound like I'm exaggerating, and if you rode that course, let me know what you thought. But personally, I thought that was a tough old road surface to ride on. It was so tough that I lost two bidons out of the bottle cages at the back there, and I'll come on to those in a minute. But knowing that I'd got those American Classic alloy rim wheels on there with much less carbon in the construction, so, Consequently, you know, to my mind, that, that carbon's gonna be just a little bit tougher than this much carbon here, and the whole thing being carbon. Um, to my mind, yeah, that was just another thing that I didn't have to worry about. I had a set of wheels that I knew would be okay in crosswinds, would be not so much of a pain in the ass if I got a puncture, and also on that road surface, you know, they just gave me a bit more confidence that they weren't going to crumble underneath me. I was so concerned, 
I've been over the bike with a fine tooth comb when I got home because honestly the vibrations were so strong. Now let me talk about, I, I mentioned these bottle cages here. I lost two bidons out of this cage here. Um, and I, when I came out of the swim, it was a really hot day. Um, we're having some unseasonably hot weather in the UK at the moment, as is everybody, I think. But when I came out of the swim, I already felt dehydrated. Now I had on the back one of these little 500 ml bottles just with electrolyte in it. And I thought, yeah, okay, I'm gonna use that when I come out of the swim. But it struck me that your first and only feed station on the bike is kind of halfway around. And I wanted to save some of that electrolyte for when I really felt that I needed it. Bad plan, I know you should hydrate when you feel thirsty immediately. But anyway, I got probably a quarter of the way around the first lap reached behind me to get the bead on and it was gone. So at the first and only feed stop on the bike course, I stopped and I necked a whole bead on of electrolyte there and I took a whole full bead on of electrolyte with me. I kept checking behind me to see that that bottle was there and all looked good until I went to get it and it wasn't. And again, you know, what had happened was that the roads had been so rough, it had just shaken the bottle out of there. Now, there is another reason for that, not just the rough roads. These bottle cages are an Amazon special. And even though I bought the ones that are strongly recommended, lots of positive reviews and all that nonsense, and they're fake spot A rated or whatever, they're you can bend these things, look, look, you know, you can just bend them like that. What I should have done is what I've done this week, gone and got myself a decent branded pair of bottle cages. So these are elite bottle cages. I've got these on my road bikes. They're just, they're great. You know, they're grippy. Um, they don't go out of shape. They're the elite brand, so you're buying a decent brand. Don't mess around buying these things. These things are roughly about the same cost as these things. So what are you gonna buy? What are you gonna buy? You're gonna buy the Amazon Special or you're gonna buy the Branded Elite? Go for the Branded Elite every time. Even if this thing is a few quid more, believe me, on race day, when you reach down behind you for a bottle of water because you're really dehydrated, worth its weight in gold. So here's the bike course in all its glory from my, uh, my ride. Now, one thing that I would say is uh, just try to ignore that little knob on the end there, because that little knob on the end there was this little knob going completely off course because he completely ignored um, a bike course sign. And that's one of the first things that I'd say is that in my head, I thought every turn would be marked with a big green and black arrow. They're not. They're marked with um, clear bike route signs, um, but they're not the biggest signs I've ever seen on a bike route, so do just keep your wits around you and don't assume that you know where you're going. So if we look at the profile of the bike course here, as you can see in this first section, it rolls, rolls really nicely. You know, there are some ups and downs and it'll certainly keep you entertained. As I say throughout that first section, do be aware of potholes, do be aware of road surfaces. Don't forget also that this is a Sunday morning and you're sharing the roads with all of the Sunday morning traffic. And if you pick a Sunday morning like last Sunday, you, you know, good weather, Beaver Castle, people wanting to bring their families out for a day, those roads could be quite busy. So just keep your wits around you. One thing that I will say about the Castle Race Series was they had motorbikes out on the course patrolling it. Now they serve two purposes. One, they're there to catch you drafting, um, but two, they are there to offer support if you need it. And I understand that they will, will even provide bike support if needed, you know, so that's a really good thing. And I would say during the bike course, I saw a motorcycle probably four or five times. So that's, you know, that's reassuring to know at least. 
So let's talk about that climb because as you can see, the bike course is essentially in two sections. A lower section, a climb, and then sort of like, you know, a flatter top section that descends back to the castle. And it was that climb that had me most worried, but I don't think it's anything to be concerned about. I think if you can handle any of your local decent climbs, you should be fine with this. I live in Essex, you know, it's not renowned for its hills. This isn't the Lake District. And this climb that we're talking about in the middle here, as you can see, it's about five kilometers long. And according to Strava here, it ramps up to, I think Strava gives it sort of plus 10% in places, you know. So it's a decent climb. It's definitely gonna work the legs. And this is definitely the climb I saw some people weaving about on. Um, but for me, it really wasn't anything to worry about. Again, I think some of that comes down to kit choice. Some of that comes down to that 32 cassette I had on the back of the Greyhound. And um, also possibly down to the fact that knowing this was gonna be a hilly course, I had done a lot of hill training before it. All of my Sunday rides included a good 50K loop to begin with um, that had a good number of hills in it. So, you know, in that 50K loop, I would put in as much elevation as there is in this entire Beaver bike course. So what does that tell you? You know, go out and train on those hills. You will be fine. Other than that, the only thing I think I'd say about the bike course is it's really scenic. If I wasn't racing, if this was a Sunday ride, this would be an incredibly enjoyable ride. And you know, I think if you had this GPX file, if you wanted to park up at Beaver Castle and go out around this circuit, it would be a lovely Sunday ride. There's some fantastic views, some fantastic scenery, some fantastic countryside, you know, great little villages you could stop in and possibly pick up a coffee or something like that. So um, a lovely, lovely bike course, one half decent climb in the middle, but not a climb that you've got to worry about. You know, you're talking about a spirited Sunday ride here, not the Fred Witten challenge. So the bike course, road bike or TT? For me, TT every day of the week. Um, TT provided you've got the right gearing. And should you be worried about that climb? I don't think you should. If you're a half decent cyclist and you've done some decent hill climbing before, you shouldn't have any problem with this bike course at all. Don't let it worry you. Go out and enjoy it. The only thing that I would say is listen carefully to the marshals. Um, and also, you know, when you get to this little section that I'm highlighting here, um, this is where I went wrong. Just be aware that you come sweeping around this bend, you come across right hander and there's an almost immediate left. That's where I was looking for, in my head, a big black and yellow uh, arrow that wasn't there. There were bike sign arrows, there were about three of them. And to be fair, there were people shouting at me as I took off up this other road. Um, you know, you live, you learn. One thing that I would say about that little faux pas there is that I began to doubt that that was the right road from the moment that I got on it. If your gut is telling you something, you can make time, you can make more time by stopping and thinking about it for a second than like I did pressing on. And it wasn't really until I got to a cattle grid covered in grass and had to just fly across it that I began thinking to myself, I bet nobody would put a cattle grid into a triathlon bike course. And I bet you if they did, they would have briefed it. But still I pressed on and I don't know why, probably, you know, just self-belief, telling myself I wouldn't have been so much of a dick that I'd miss a turning. Yeah, I was a dick, I missed a turning. And you know, just don't get yourself into that position where you have got confirmation bias that, yeah, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Yeah, yeah, I've gone straight on. They wouldn't send us left because they possibly would. Look for the road signs, listen, listen to the marshals. If you hear somebody shouting, wonder why they're shouting, stop for a second. It could save you a lot of time. I lost five to six minutes uh, because of this uh, descent and climb back that I did uh, twice. So, you know, what do you learn from that? 
Anyway, bike course, don't worry about it. It's a lovely bike course, it's a scenic bike course, it's challenging in places, but if you're a half decent cyclist, no worries. So I think that's everything you need to know about the bike. Um, the run, let me talk about the run. The run is um, off-road, so you should, in my opinion, be running in an off-road shoe. Um, on the day that we ran, I mean, it was incredibly dry and it had been dry for days before, if not possibly weeks by the look of the course. Um, there were still a few deep muddy puddles to be found, um, but, you know, I would say if you had kind of a standard British weather pattern and you had some water on that course, it would be, it would be really tough run in road shoes. So I think you should be looking at trail shoes. For me, the obvious choice was my Caldera 7s. I cannot tell you how much I love these shoes. Um, I run road and trail in these and just the best shoe I've ever run in. And that's saying something. Um, given that, you know, I just allowed Brooks to tell me what to run in and their online shoe finder found these for me and I'm eternally glad that it did. I'm gonna be buying several pairs of these before they go out of circulation. So for me, you know, off-road trainers for that course and my personal choice, these Caldera 7s. Just put those down there. Um, the run course, let's have a look at the run course profile. So what tips can I give you for the run course that I haven't already? Well, as you can see from the map here, it's quite technical. It twists and it turns. It goes up and down. And believe me, there are a lot of ups. Um, and there is one very steep down. Pace yourself. When you get onto these first climbs here, um, these are the ones where I, I started running because I, you know, I'd never run this course before I didn't know what was coming. Trust me, that first climb isn't it. They go on and on and on. So don't burn all your matches. Walk if you need to. Everyone was walking by the time I got to probably three quarters of the way up this first climb and I started walking as well. There's as much time to be had by not blowing up later in the run, by saving a bit of energy here um, and pacing yourself. There is one really steep descent. Now, you run this how you want to. My advice would be, I wasn't gonna run that descent because it was really steep. It's the sort of steep descent that you can get out of control on quite easily. And a fall there could cost you dear later in the run. Like I say, pace yourself. You know, you're a good distance into the run. Now, one thing as you can probably see from the map here on Strava, this isn't your standard 10K Olympic distance run. This is an 11K run. So there's a bit of running to be had in this triathlon overall together, considering that you've got an extra kilometer on the run compared to a, a normal um, Olympic distance. Plus you've got that 600 meter run out of the lake to transition. Somebody said to me, you really get your money's worth. The only other thing that I'd say about the run course is that as you come across this last section here, um, I haven't really got any footage of it. Here's a picture of me running into the finish chute. The finish chute is a little bit deceiving. Now, what you'll find is you'll come running across this grassy meadow here and you get to the start of the barriers and you think, wow, yeah, that's it, I've done it. And there was a, like a cable across the, the middle of the, the run course and I thought to myself, so is that it? Is that the timing, Matt? You know, is that my run done? It's not. You've got to run on from that and then you do a sharp right into the finish chute. You cannot miss the inflatable arch. Don't turn right until you see the inflatable arch. See the inflatable arch, turn through, t turn right, run through it, job done. And again, you know, the run, like the, um, the bike course, yeah, it's challenging. Yeah, it's hilly. 
and I have to be honest with you and unlike the bike I don't really have anywhere locally where I can train hills so I was properly unprepared for the amount of hills in this run but even for somebody like me that's ostensibly a flat runner um, there weren't too many challenges if you pace yourself and again like I say I think it's all about pacing yourself and definitely at this stage in the run there are a couple of uh, sorry at this stage in the race there are a couple of water stations one as you come out of transition and one roughly kind of halfway around the run make full use of them fuel and get some liquids on board especially if it's a hot day um, but definitely for this run I think you know fueling is a really important thing I, I generally tend not to fuel on runs and even I took some gels and some of the uh, shot block sort of things the uh, the edible little cubes that they got from precision hydra hydration and I worked through a couple of those on the run just to keep me going so you know fueling and keeping hydrated I think would be important for everybody on this run so there you go the beaver standard distance triathlon organized in this case by the castle race series um, a race I would really recommend you know for me coming back this was my first Olympic distance in probably six years um, and it was a really nice way to come back just because it was a well-organized event it was a course that was just challenging enough that it felt like I'd had a good beating at the end of it but it didn't demotivate you in any part um, and it was really a good opportunity to for somebody like me coming back to the sport start relearning my racecraft so anyway, I hope this is useful to you if you're doing this race or if you've done this race and you've got some thoughts and opinions on what I've said here, you know, share them with me because I'm, I'm all ears. You know, this is just one person's opinion. Your race might have been very different um, and I would be incredibly open to kind of hearing, you know, how everybody else's race went, who was there on the day. But equally, if you're preparing for this race at some point in the future, I hope this might just be useful to you. Anyway, thanks for watching this one, YouTube, and I'll catch you in the next.